Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you this morning, and uh, I've looked forward to this. I had such a great time with you last time. You all uh, were very well behaved. Uh, it was easy to pick up after you, um, and uh, you didn't eat much, though, so uh, uh, that's all a joke. Um, I guess you're muted, so it's your choice whether to laugh or not. Uh, <laughs> I hope that you're doing well and surviving uh, this uh, time of containment. And hopefully we're ra rounding a corner. Uh, I guess it depends on who you listen to. Um, but uh, it, th these are trying times, difficult times, as uh, we continue this um, coronavirus containment. You know, last time I uh, put forth uh, a, a few questions. And one of those questions was, what do you think God is teaching us during this time? And uh, a few of you commented, um, join me in prayer, please. Okay. Father in heaven, we come before your throne today, and we thank you for this time in your word. And we pray, God, that you would be exalted and glorified in all that's uh, done and said here today. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, who's our teacher, our guide, and our friend. And I pray that you would encourage each one here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Well, last time I introduced a series of discussion questions. And one of those questions was, uh, what do you think God is teaching us during this time of containment? I do believe that he is uh, doing some great things. Uh, I think he's uh, getting the attention of many. Um, some have said that this is a time that's uh, uh, preparing us for revival, that uh, many people hopefully will come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, others uh, are saying that this time is uh, bringing to the surface the things that really matter. And uh, one of those things is the, values of, uh, the value of friendship and uh, relationships. But um, Chris... Uh, Christine Neff uh, put forth uh, some answers, uh, and she spent some time reflecting on that question, uh, what do you think God is teaching us? And I was very impressed with her answers, and I'd like to share them with you this morning. Um, and uh, Dr. Drake had a great message last week on uh, joy in the midst of uh, containment, and uh, it, coming from James chapter 1. Uh, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And so um, J Drake was absolutely right that uh, life contains a certain amount of trial. Um, and just last night, uh, maybe you were able to participate in the um, show of support to Nancy Simon and family and Eric Schmitz as uh, there were many of us that uh, drove by, placed a candle on their front stoop or on their front uh, sidewalk as a show of love and support in the passing of Ralph and the passing of Lori. Uh, that was a great display of community. It was a great display of community. And uh, I know that Nancy was just overcome with emotion. I know that Eric shed some tears as well. Um, beautiful picture of Lori on uh, the table there on, uh, on the front porch of Eric's home. So um, it was very touching for them. Uh, and, and I think that that was a way in which we overcame the restrictions of, of the day uh, to show love, to show support, and it was a great example of community. Well, um, as we take another look at community this morning, um, consider the, the question, what do you think God is teaching us? And this is what uh, Christine Neff had to say. She said um, that not to rely on ourselves, um, uh, our society and our culture in the U.S. for some time has gotten away uh, from the values that are grounded in respect and from Christ's teaching. It seems that prosperity reigns, and we people think it's been us 
that has made that happen. And we think we can fix everything. I couldn't agree more. Uh, in our very affluent, very prosperous country, uh, we seem to think maybe parallel to the attitude before um, the, the miracle that God displayed at the building of the Tower of Babel, where the people were of one mind and they thought that they could do anything and everything. And uh, that's kind of the arrogance that is around us today. Um, so God is teaching us um, to appreciate the people, family, children that you live with by the time that you have, uh, by the time that you have with them here and now. So hopefully this containment is con teaching all of us that, uh, that people are important, um, that relationships are important. Instead of chasing games, practices, coaching sessions, travel tournaments, dance conventions, that we need to sit and listen to uh, our kids, eat meals together, read with them, and pray with them? And uh, that answer is yes. Um, th this is a time of opportunity, especially with teenagers. How often are they out and about with their friends or going to sports practices or doing whatever, and um, parents and family are, are left uh, alone? Uh, so this is a, an opportunity to connect with them in a very powerful way. Thirdly, now that many sh store shelves are bare, uh, God is teaching us to learn to do without. Um, what you can't get at the store, maybe we need to wait one or two more weeks to get. Um, and so we're learning the, the, the lesson of contentment or how to be creative or how to get by. Fourthly, uh, to let go of the stress that it takes to manage everything in your life. The, the belief that, that God will provide and so we have to trust him. Uh, that he's sovereign and he's working, uh, that he's doing something uh, as this uh, coronavirus uh, containment time um, continues to unfold. Um, and patience. God is teaching us patience. You know, there's an old joke that says, don't pray for patience because uh, God uh, might orchestrate the events that uh, will force you to have it. Um, but this, these circumstances are teaching us to have patience, patience with one another, um, patience with ourselves. And Chris says, be patient that in time this illness will be a sad memory. I agree. The sooner the better. Lastly, go outside just to be outside and enjoy God's landscape rather than the landscape of our perfectly decorated homes. Um, it and God's creatures are more beautiful no matter what time of year and what kind of weather. And uh, I appreciate what uh, Jim and Karen Faber said last week, that they had noticed uh, because of their time at home, that they had noticed that there was a hawk building a nest on their property. And so um, another f uh, f friend from Kansas has been filming uh, on his uh, Facebook page uh, a fox uh, that had, um, uh, uh, would you call them cubs? Uh, a bunch of cubs, um, uh, babies underneath his shed. And so, um, uh, you know, it, it's a time to stop and observe and enjoy nature. Um, so those are some great lessons that I think that the Lord is teaching us. And uh, I appreciate those, Chris. Um, excellent. Well, community. When we think about community, uh, community means maybe several things to several people. It might uh, be defined as the place where we live. Uh, it might be our circle of friends. Um, but we want to address the, the value of the body of Christ because that is an example of community that hopefully touches us on a regular basis um, every week, if not several times a week. Um, I want to show you uh, 
some pictures here. Now, uh, consider the following statement. Community can either be life-giving or community can be toxic. What do I mean by that? Well, the pictures that you see on the screen right now, and hopefully you can share, you, you can see that. Okay, yeah. What, um, what occasion in American history uh, is portrayed in the, um, in the life magazine photos that you see on your screen there? Any idea? The end of World War II. End of World War II. World War II. Yes, the end of World War II. This was VE Day. Uh, anybody remember the date? May the 5th. Oh, very good guess. Um, so we're coming up on the 75th anniversary of VE Day, which was May 9th, 1945. May 9th, 1945. And I guess this is on because uh, I, I would I would assume that the picture on the left is the square. The picture on the right is a famous uh, picture of a sailor uh, kissing a gal, and uh, I'm not sure that they knew each other before this time. Anyway, but uh, this was a time where a shared experience brought everybody together. Everyone in the country was elated, so it was a, a shared experience that was. Uh, translated to the whole country that at least part of the war ha had ended and uh, was a wonderful day in our country's history. So community can be life-giving, life-giving. But how can community be toxic? Well, that's a strange statement, but it's true in the respect that um, just recently uh, in Albany, Georgia, if you've been keeping up with the news, uh, maybe you have noticed what came out of Albany, Georgia. When we think of coronavirus hotspots, we might think of New York City, we might think of Philadelphia, even Montgomery County for our own state, but Al Albany, Georgia does not come to mind. This is a town of about 75,000 people. Uh, I'm not sure where in the, in the state of Georgia it is, how close it is to Atlanta or whatever. But uh, Albany, Georgia, two funerals happened. One was of a young man that was in a car accident, and another was of a well-loved custodian at a local school. And those funerals were close together. And as a result of that funeral and people not paying attention to social distancing, um, there were over 100 cases of the coronavirus and uh, nine have died among the nine, and this was a couple of weeks ago, among the nine that died, six in one family, and the pastor of one of the funerals. And uh, so community can be toxic, not intentionally toxic, but you add something like what we're going through and community certainly can be harmful. Well, we want to talk about uh, today how community is essential, and we're going to talk about a couple of elements of community uh, that prove uh, that it's essential for us. And so um, God has a different idea of community than most of us think. And uh, we get this idea of, uh, in his word, the Bible. Our idea of community is uh, linking with those that we uh, believe the same way, we maybe vote the same way, or we, maybe we look alike, or uh, maybe we have a common experience. Uh, one of the things that I've enjoyed over the last few weeks is um, the uh, reemergence of some friendships from high school, and there's about 10 of us uh, that we all graduated together, and uh, we uh, some of us have dropped out of touch for um, 30 years, and so we're reacquainting ourselves with each other, and so we're on a texting string. There's about 10 of us, and I now hear from uh, several of these guys every single day. There are times that I, I need to leave the conversation, but uh, <laughs> it's a little bit hard to do, but... Um, but these guys, I've grown up with them. I went to high school with them. I graduated with them. And, 
after we graduated from high school, of course, like anybody else, some of them, uh, uh, we became separated. We um, went in different directions, went to different schools, went to different careers. But now uh, we are together again. And uh, God's idea of community, though, is different than ours. Uh, God's idea of community centers around the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, a picture of heaven gives us an idea of what community looks like in God's eyes. Uh, Revelation 5, verse 9. This is a picture in heaven. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. This was the song that the myriads upon myriads of angels sang um, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, as they surrounded the throne of the Lord. And so God has ransomed people from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And so the church from its very beginning, was meant to be a diverse community centered around the grace, love, and transformative power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why someone from Nevada, Missouri can come and become a brother to someone from Franconia Township, Pennsylvania. How we can uh, maybe grew up with different practices, maybe even different foods. Um, different ways of looking at things, and yet we can become good friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's a wonderful thing to think about when, when we consider community, how God forms community and he creates it, and it centers around the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's always the sin problem. There's always the problem of human nature and uh, that, that we can upset community as God intends it to be. And so as fallen human beings, we are predisposed to division and isolation. And you say, well, what are you talking about, Pastor David? Well, this is something that uh, I discovered just this week. How many times does the Apostle Paul in his epistles address division or controversy in some way, shape, or form. And uh, it would seem that he does it nearly in every letter. Here, I'll just give you three examples. Take, for instance, the infamous congregation at Corinth. And I have been able to visit this place um, two times in my life, in 2010 and in 2014. And Corinth uh, was well known for the divisions that took place there. It was a very diverse community and people came to faith uh, from lots of different backgrounds. Um, and you had the whole um, Hellenistic uh, pantheon uh, worshiping all kinds of Greek gods. You had uh, the influence of Roman culture. Um, you also had the influence of Judaism, first century Judaism. And uh, so believers uh, came to faith in Christ coming out of some of that culture. Uh, it was a melting pot uh, religiously and philosophically. And so not everyone got along and uh, people were, uh, you know, living according to their fleshly desires and doing what they wanted. And so Paul said, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. And so Paul had to address the conflicts that were taking place at the church in Corinth. Another example of division and strife was in the, Paul's letter to the Galatians. And uh, there were those that were following after the Judaizers. Uh, a group that had infiltrated the church and was teaching, teaching a false uh, um, theology that uh, belief in Jesus Christ was okay, but 
you also had to be circumcised. That in order to be a genuine Christian, you had to follow through with circumcision. And as the old saying goes, if, if, if your equation for salvation is Christ plus anything, then it's wrong. You always get the wrong answer. Uh, that salvation is only found in Christ. But Paul says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So he addressed the division that was in the church, churches of Galatia. And then finally, uh, something that's a little more subtle is uh, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. And this letter that has its major theme, joy, even though Paul wrote it from prison, uh, he mentions joy some 13 times in this letter. But he also addresses the subtle division that took place between two ladies that were very involved in church life and uh, were, were true servants of the Lord. Um, and he says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women. And so uh, evidently, uh, these two ladies, they were noble, they were full of faith, they served the Lord in the church, but they could not get along. And so Paul was encouraging them to get along through uh, their pastor. Now, someone very famous in American history said the following statement, and, uh, uh, and I'm going to ask you again, uh, this is a, a quasi lesson in American history. You did very well on that first question. Let's see if you can get this. Okay, this may be a little bit more uh, with your timeline uh, that you're familiar with. Who said this uh, statement? It is appalling that mo the most segregated hour in Christian America is 11 a.m. on Sunday. Who said that? It, it is appalling that the most segregated hour in Christian America is 11 a.m. on Sunday. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, My dad said Martin Luther. Yes, Martin Luther King Jr. He said it in December of 1963. Uh, when you think about that, uh, it is it, it seems to be true. Hopefully, there are signs that um, in some circles of America that this is uh, diminishing. But um, God means for his church to be diverse from people of every tongue, tribe, and nation. And it's a wonderful thing where um, Asian Christians and African-American Christians or, um, or African Christians can come and worship with Caucasian Christians and, and uh, Latino Christians. Uh, that's God's design. But in our country's history, it seems that uh, the church uh, has had a long history of, of segregation. Uh, yeah, Martin Luther King Jr., December 18th of 1963. So, um, but there are signs that uh, we are uh, becoming, a, 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 the body of Christ is evolving. And so uh, Michael Horton, who is a theologian and teaches at Westminster Seminary in California, um, shared about his church that he ministers at. He says, our church was planted several years ago by mostly Dutch immigrant, by a mostly Dutch immigrant church in a predominantly Dutch immigrant denomination. Ordained in this body, I am part of a growing number of outsiders who have been welcomed into this fellowship of saints with, rich, with, a, with a rich heritage. Sounds like the Schwenkfelders in some ways. We have a very rich heritage. Increasingly, our churches, especially new church plants, reflect a broad ethnic, generational, and socioeconomic profile. Uh, that's the goal. That's the goal. 
Among the many encouraging things that older members in our churches hear as non-Dutch believers join is the surprise, especially of younger people who have had visits from the pastor or elders. This has been going on for generations, centuries in fact, and those who have been raised in it sometimes take it for granted. Newcomers report with excitement. Listen to this. They just called me on the phone. And then they came over to my apartment and we had a couple of cups of coffee and they asked me how things were going. They read some scripture and prayed with me. Some are surprised because they are new Christians. Others are surprised because they were raised in churches where this just never happened. And many had never met their pastor and did not know their elders' names. So that's pretty convicting. Um, and it tells us that uh, we ought to be uh, more intentional about our outreach and more intentional in our efforts to welcome others. That there are those, it's convicting in, in this way, that there are those that have been a part of churches in the past where they have not known who the pastor was and that the, that the church did not take a concerted effort to get to know its members. Uh, the, the body of Christ, the, the Lord's church, should be known for its truth, its power, and its love. So let's look at a couple of essentials for Christian community uh, in the remainder of time that we have together. Um, our church must be known for its mutual affection and support. Mutual affection and support. Uh, Jesus said in John 13, 34, part of the upper room discourse, uh, he said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So the Lord, here he is preparing his disciples before he is to um, go to the garden and pray, and all of the disciples are going to fall asleep on him, but he's going to pray, and uh, then he's going to be betrayed into the hands of uh, uh, the authorities, and he's going to be tried unfairly throughout the night, and he will eventually go to the cross. But he's preparing them, and he gives them a new commandment. Um, some would argue, I'm not so sure this was a brand new commandment, but maybe a renewed commandment. But it certainly was a commandment that they ought to focus strongly on love for one another. Um, also, uh, Romans 12, verse 9. Paul wrote, in probably arguably his greatest theological work, uh, the letter to the Romans, where he uh, teaches us on the beauty of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, he, he says in the practical uh, portion of the book, uh, after he discusses spiritual gifts, he says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. And so uh, love ought to be genuine. And so when we think of biblical love, it, it, it's not an emotion. It's not uh, an affinity toward uh, someone else that you agree with or like or share a common uh, experience with. That might be true, but I think it takes us further down the road than just that. Um, that biblical love ought to be authentic, that it ought to come from the heart, and uh, it's something that we think as well as feel, um, that it ought to be discerning, in other words, it's willing to tell the truth. Um, when a person, when, when a close friend uh, is, is involved um, in behavior that is destructive, 
that the person who truly loves them is not the person that just, oh, live and let live. You see a person who's going down a road and their behavior, their lifestyle, their habits are actually contributing to their self-destruction. Uh, the one who practices genuine love is not the person that says, oh, uh, what's good for them is fine. Um, live and let live. I've had two friends that have died prematurely, both around the, the age of uh, 50 years old over the past couple of years that um, were, um, they did not take care of themselves. Uh, one of uh, one of whom was uh, a binge drinker. He uh, was drinking a case of beer um, three times a week. Uh, another had a heart problem, and he would not take his medication. And he ate and drank whatever uh, he uh, he wished. In fact, it's the death of these two close friends from Missouri that um, brought together this group of friends that I mentioned at the beginning of our time that we now we text nearly every day with each other. Um, these two fellas that were a part of this group when we were back in high school, they passed away prematurely and it really got the attention of many of us in the group. And so we're really, we're, we are, some of us are reevaluating the way that we're living our lives. So, um, it ought to be discerning, willing to tell the truth. Um, it ought to be loyal. Um, take, for instance, the example of David and Jonathan in the Bible. And uh, when you read the story of David and Jonathan, Jonathan um, was the son of Saul, Israel's first king. And Jonathan could have hated David or... Had, could have been indifferent to David because David uh, could have been seen as an obstacle to Jonathan's uh, ability to uh, achieve the throne. But Jonathan loved David, and David loved Jonathan. They were best friends. And in fact, Jonathan loved David so much that uh, he was willing to sacrifice his own welfare so that David could be protected and preserved and ready for the throne. And so, uh, and it eventually cost Jonathan his life. Uh, and also, uh, love must be unselfish. In other words, it ought to be uh, uh, following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ when he said, uh, greater love had no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Uh, Bob Russell who wrote uh, the book, The Power of One Another, which is what uh, I'm taking some of today's lesson from, and Pastor Julian is going to be uh, uh, taking his lesson from next week. Bob Russell tells the story of he's uh, been invited to preach at, at another congregation on this special Sunday, and so uh, he showed up early, and he had some time to go over his notes for his message. And so he went into the sanctuary maybe an hour before uh, the service began. And uh, he sat in the back pew and he was going over his notes. And he noticed that the organist was in there practicing. And uh, she was uh, going over a particular refrain in uh, something that the congregation would sing uh, week in and week out. Um, and she was going over that refrain and, and she was making sure uh, the timing of it was just right. She played it some 30 times while he was in there going over his sermon because he, she wanted to get the music right. Uh, maybe it was, uh, you know, turn your eyes upon Jesus. She wanted to make sure that she got the, the tune right. And so she practiced it. And so when the people came and they, uh, experienced the service and, and the organist played uh, that song as she did every Sunday, um, they could have thought, oh, that sounds nice. She did a good job. But did they understand uh, the time and the effort that it took to practice her craft and to get it right so that they could enjoy it?
Uh, love is unselfish. Um, the last thing that I'd like to share with you in our time uh, that remains is also that our church must be known for its biblical tolerance, biblical tolerance. Now, uh, tolerance is a word that's used today that gets all kinds of um, definitions. Uh, I mentioned the phrase live and let live earlier, but um, biblical tolerance is not live and let live, okay? Biblical tolerance is the ability to love someone for who they are or whatever they're involved in, but not willing to disregard their spiritual life and um, their relationship with God. So Romans 15, 7 says, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Some versions would say, Therefore, accept one another as Christ has accepted you. Okay? So we ought to have an attitude of a welcoming love um, toward people of all backgrounds and all practices, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to agree with what they are doing or how they're living, but that we love the person for the sake of the person and for the sake of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Another verse that goes along with this is James chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So it's the ability not to show partiality, that you don't like someone because uh, uh, you've known them for decades upon end and you show them partiality versus someone that you just met. Um, or that um, it, it's not, you know, it, it goes along with uh, the idea that, well, um, that I gravitate to people that are just like me at the sacrifice of those who are unlike me. Take, for instance, Jesus' uh, experience with a woman at the well. Now, this is just a, a, a great experience of showing biblical tolerance. Uh, Jesus interacts with a woman at the well in John chapter 4, and um, there are several barriers that are there between this woman and Jesus. Number one, um, so if you remember the story, Jesus goes to the well uh, and uh, there, uh, and it's in the middle of the day, and so nobody is around. And this woman comes, a Samaritan woman, and uh, Jesus asks for a drink. And the Samaritan woman knows that Jesus is a Jew. Maybe it has to do with how he talked, what his dialect was, or maybe Jesus looked a certain way. And so the Samaritan woman, she knew that she was speaking to a Jew, and this Jewish man had spoken to her and said, please give me a drink. And uh, the Samaritan woman says, you know, you're a Jew. You don't have much to do with us Samaritans. And there were several barriers to a community relationship there. Number one, there was a racial barrier. She was a Samaritan. Jesus was a Jew. Another example is, is that there was a gender barrier. Um, Jesus spoke to a Samaritan woman. Um, Jewish men, there is a recorded prayer that Jewish men, some I would say some Jewish men, Maybe not all Jewish men, but some Jewish men would pray in the first century that they would wake up in the morning and they would, they, would, they would pray to God and say, God, thank you that I am born not a tax collector or a woman. So um, there was a big divide uh, in gender. Um, women uh, were treated as property. And um, it wasn't uncommon for a Jewish man to have more than one wife. Uh, and so um, Jesus is speaking to a Samaritan. He's speaking to a woman. And he's treating her with a certain amount of respect. And not only that, 
there's a spiritual divide too, because you remember that the woman, um, let's just say she had uh, uh, multiple relationships. Uh, in fact, she had five marriages. And the, the man that she lived with at that time was not her husband. Uh, as someone said, her wedding gown was wash and wear. <laughs> so she was a woman with a tainted past. And uh, she had been married many times. And she was living with a man out of wedlock right now. And so uh, Jesus, in speaking with her, uncovers all of this, not in a mean way, but in a way in which he was communicating with her and he was revealing to this woman who he was. And uh, the woman said, I, I, I discern that you're a prophet. And uh, eventually Jesus owns up to the fact that he is the Messiah. And so the woman goes back to her town and speaks with everyone um, that she has met the Messiah. So uh, that is a great ex uh, example of biblical tolerance um, uh, in which uh, we're able to cross barriers and we're able to bridge gaps where we're speaking or associating with people who are unlike us, but we are still very loyal to who God is and what he's done in our lives. Um, so last thing that I wanted to share with you are Bob Russell's suggestions to defeat intolerance and to build bridges. Let me just share with you these in closing in our time left. And then uh, maybe in five minutes here, we'll uh, have some chance for questions. Um, number one, it's important to compare yourself to Jesus, not others. Luke chapter 18, verse 14, Jesus says, Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And so when we associate with others, it's important not to compare yourself with others, but to compare yourself with Jesus. And if you do so, you'll immediately be, uh, hopefully, uh, be given a wellspring of gratitude for what Christ has done in your life. Jesus is perfect. You and I certainly are not. And so it gives us an opportunity to talk to others and to maybe not focus on their faults. Secondly, stand for your convictions with a gentle spirit. Ephesians 4 verse 15 says, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. And so when we associate others, we don't leave our convictions at the door, but if we are given the opportunity to share them, that we do so with a gentle spirit. Next, that we reach out in friendship to the person with whom we disagree. Um, that we ought to have friendships with people that are different than we are. Um, that we're willing to uh, befriend those that um, approach life differently from a different angle uh, so that we can learn, so that we can grow, so that we can give, have opportunities to witness. Um, Jesus said, love your enemies in the Sermon on the Mount and pray for those who persecute you. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that those who disagree with you are automatically your enemies, but they come from an, uh, a, a position of opposition. And so um, to reach out to uh, those who disagree with you um, is good. Next, uh, listen patiently to, uh, to those who are different than you. Um, I, you know, I, I just had my 50th birthday back in December and the older that I get, the more that I realize that, uh, there's so many people that do not have, um, uh, good listening skills. And, uh, it's convicting for me because I want to have good listening skills. And, uh, that's part of being a pastoral counselor. And so part of, uh, 
listening well is found in Philippians 2, verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. We can say this politically. You know, why do certain candidates, I'll leave parties out of the picture, but why are certain uh, people so strongly behind certain candidates? Um, what is it that brings them to, to their position? Uh, could it be that they've experienced something? Could it be that, uh, that they're tired of maybe a particular issue in our country right now? Or um, that, that has led them to believe a certain way politically? Um, are, do, do you have the time and the ability to stop and listen to them and to see where they're coming from. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with them, but are you willing to listen to them? And then lastly, to practice seeing people the way that God sees them. Wonderful verse in 1 Samuel 16 is when um, uh, God is speaking to the prophet Samuel, and uh, Samuel has shown up at the, to the home of Jesse, uh, David's father, and you remember, David had multiple brothers. And, um, you know, Jesse is preparing uh, all of them to be the next king, possibly. And so uh, God says to Samuel, you know, the one that's, that, that, that you're to, to, to uh, ordain as king is, is actually out taking care of uh, uh, the flocks. And it was David, the youngest. And yet, uh, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on the appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so, we need to be a people that look upon the heart. Um, now, people can be misguided by their hearts, but we can't argue with intention. And it might just be an opportunity to understand where people are coming from if you look at their intentions, you look at their motivations, you look at their heart. Well, those are a few things about community that I wanted to share with you today. In closing, uh, a big, one of the reasons that community is so important is because loneliness is so prevalent. In our information age, with um, uh, people can be isolated, people, people can be so uh, driven to, to be in their own little world, uh, and people, um, their view of life goes down if they are extremely lonely. There's a, there's a Russian proverb that says, it is unpleasant to go alone, even to be drowned. There's also an Irish saying that says, strife is better than loneliness. So sometimes, in an effort to uh, not be lonely, people will even do the worst. So never underestimate um, the power of loneliness and the blessing of community. So let's take you off of mute. Anyone, anybody have any comments or questions? Yes. Uh, just the thought occurred to me about being patient with those who are different than you. And I think of some of the early states that are trying to open up and, uh, it, it does take patience <laughs> You know, just uh, thinking the motives of opening up their states early and the potential problems with it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm just thinking of the community of our church, and we're all part of different communities. We have our church community, we have our family, we have uh, social communities. And how important it is that we get our strength and our direction from, from our Christian community. And um, it, it's challenging because sometimes we are with people who do not agree with us or who do not have the same 
uh, thinking that we have. And so we constantly need to go back to our, our Christian community so that the influences that work on us are the positive ones and the ones that are pleasing to God. Mm. So uh, we're very happy to be part of this Schwenkfelder, central Schwenkfelder community. Oh, we're, we're glad to have you, Ruth and Gary. Um, you know, I was struck. Those, those five uh, scriptures that you mentioned, David, and, and the, uh, the comments along with them, it, as I, I was sitting here in our, in our den and looking at my books to my left, I was struck uh, that, I guess, a number of months ago, uh, Dr. Drake recommended a book. In fact, it was, it was available in the Narthex. And uh, I picked it up, and it's and it's called Christians in the Age of Outrage, mm. uh, and it's by Ed Stetzer. How to bring our best when the world is at its worst. Mm -hmm. And I only bring that up because it 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 really addresses so many of the points that you made there that are that we kind of we kind of become accustomed to reacting a certain way and and. Uh, not thinking nearly as much of the other person as we should, or, or listening, all, all such great points. And uh, if anyone's interested in, in delving into that a little more uh, substantially, I, that book is really something that I think stands out uh, in this topic. So I just wanted to mention that. Ah, thank you, that's great. Yeah, Ed Stetzer, Christians in the Age of Outrage. Um, since the uh, uh, Carl, you just mentioned that um, uh, we are going to have uh, the summer Sunday school, assuming we all get back to uh, normal, <laughs> on Ed Stetzer's next book, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, called Christians at Our Best. Um, so uh, we'll be looking, that builds off of that one that you just mentioned, uh, Carl. So Great. David, thank you for the thought-provoking study uh, this morning. Uh, I think it's really good to, to think about these elements of community. Um, I should emphasize that we as a pastoral staff are really cognizant uh, of this, even though we can't uh, be together right now. Um, we encourage you to be involved with some of these sessions that are ha happening at uh, various times during the week. Such as uh, Tuesday at noon, uh, we have a prayer meeting. We'd love to have more of you present uh, for that from 12 to 1. Then the pastors are leading a, um, a, a study at Wednesday at 12, and that also goes to 1. Uh, many of you can't come to these things, but now that you're quarantined, maybe you can. Uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, Pat Graham is here, and I know she's uh, leading a uh, also a church-wide Bible study on Thursday evening at 7.15. Is that right, Pat? It's actually at 7 p.m. At 7 p.m. Um, so we encourage you for that. Uh, there are also men's and women's studies uh, that are happening by <laughs> Uh, we encourage community, and we hope that uh, you'll join us um, uh, at these times. Excellent. You know, it's funny, um, Dr. Drake, you say that in meeting together. It makes me think of Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Ironically, you can't meet together but it's a blessing to be able to meet together <laughs> right now and those other times, uh, you know, virtually. So praise God for these opportunities and they're, they're sweet in ways that maybe we've taken for granted in the past. So I see a lot of silver lining and God's working through. This pandemic. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us today, and I hope that you were blessed by it. And uh, I'd like to close this with prayer. And uh, let me just encourage you that, um, you know, this is not going to last forever. Um, but uh, although we'll probably be the last <laughs> county in Pennsylvania to open up, hopefully it won't be too much longer. And so uh, we just need to trust in the Lord to wait on him and uh, to pray for one another, and uh, it is a blessing to be able to gather like this. So um, 
Let me pray for you all. Father, I just thank you for each person that's represented here today. Thank you that, Lord, you led them to be a part of this class. And, Lord, uh, we do realize the value of community, that uh, it is something that we uh, uh, absolutely need. In fact, as Tim Keller said last Sunday, that we cannot grow apart from community, that we need the body of Christ, that we need each other, uh, that there's a reason that we're called brothers and sisters in the Lord. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would bless each one here today. Uh, we all are going through this experience with different feelings. Some of us are fine. Others of us, it is beginning to wear on us. And others of us, maybe we're depressed a little. I pray that you would encourage each one here today. Thank you, Lord, for our time in your word. Help us to practice uh, love and biblical toleration, and patience, and um, mutual affection, and uh, because that is what you did toward us, Lord Jesus. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Amen everybody. Thank well, you, David. Thank you, Pastor David. My pleasure. David. Thank you.